without gasoline. Put away the Porsche. No more NASCAR. So long, speedboat. Hang up the Harley. Ground that plane. Take away the tank. Gasoline fuels the world. And not just the fast and the furious. Businesses, commuters, and even soccer moms depend on it. Worldwide, gasoline is extremely important. Third world countries are aspiring to become modern, and as they do so, the demand for gasoline goes up. Uh, mobility is very important. And for better or worse, Americans rely more heavily on gasoline than any other country. In Europe and some other countries, there's more emphasis on public transportation. Here in the United States, uh, people are used to taking their cars everywhere they go. So if suddenly, you know, gasoline disappeared from the universe, Americans would have a pretty hard time going about their daily lives. Drivers in the USA use about 360 million gallons of gasoline every single day. That's big business, to say the least. Without gasoline, modern cities would not exist in the way they do in the U.S. We built a mass transit system around one or two people driving on autom automobiles all around a, a large metropolitan area. We're making adjustments to that, needed adjustments, carpooling, but it's hard to imagine a time when our economy won't rely heavily on gasoline and gasoline-powered vehicles. One reason why gasoline will be around for a long time is that it provides a lot of power. One gallon of gasoline provides the equivalent of more than 36,000 watt-hours of energy, enough to run a colored television for more than a month. There are some alternatives that provide even more energy, like hydrogen-powered fuel cells. But right now, gasoline gives us all the other things we need in a fuel that the other options can't yet match. We're asking it to provide low emissions, good fuel economy. We're asking it to not contribute to deposit buildup in the engine or contribute to the failure of emissions control equipment. We want it to be fully available when we want it and at as low a cost as possible. That low as possible price isn't always as cheap as we'd like. But considering all the steps gasoline goes through before it enters your tank, it's still a pretty good bargain. Crude oil has to be found brought up from thousands of feet below the surface, shipped thousands of miles to a billion dollar refinery, squeezed through all of that expensive refining equipment, moved to cities through thousands of miles of underground pipelines, pumped into tanker trucks, and delivered to service stations. Look at the price of a gallon of gasoline, especially after you subtract the taxes, versus the price of a gallon of bottled water. Gasoline is a around a dollar a gallon, plus or minus, after you subtract taxes. And we're hard pressed to find even a liter of bottled water that isn't well over a, a dollar a gallon. Obviously, bottled water makers aren't selling 360 million gallons a day. But the main reason gasoline is cheaper is an efficient production and delivery infrastructure. And the modern refinery is at the heart of that system. Refineries are huge billion-dollar complexes, often covering the area of 100 football fields. In a single day, a large refinery can transform 400,000 barrels of crude oil into millions of gallons of gasoline and other refined products. Despite their size, all of the work is being done on a molecular scale. The crude oil fed into the refinery is made almost entirely of hydrocarbons chains of carbon atoms in various lengths, surrounded by hydrogen. Inside the refinery, all of these hydrocarbon chains are separated in what are known as fractionating towers or columns. One of the most distinctive features of any refinery. Furnaces next to the tower heat the oil to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. The hydrocarbons boil off like steam from shortest to longest except for the thickest semi-solid products. And there are a series of trays in the column, so the lighter product will rise as a gas through what's called bubblers. They actually allow a liquid level to stay on the tray. The gas comes through until it comes to the point where it condenses at that level of cooling. We can draw off those fractions the lighter materials have just a few carbons in each molecule. 
For example, propane with three carbons and butane, a four carbon chain. These will go right out of the top of the tower since they are still in a gaseous form, even after they cool back down to normal temperatures. Gasoline is mostly comprised of fairly light molecules with between six and 10 carbons. They rise nearly to the top of the column before condensing back to liquid. The liquid is then removed through side tubes. Kerosene, slightly heavier, weighs in at 12 to 15 carbons. Diesel fuel settles and condenses just below that since it's in the 15 to 18 carbon range. Lubricating oils, including engine motor oils, are even thicker since they have longer chains than gasoline or diesel. And the heavyweight products with 20 or more carbons in each chain collect at the bottom of the tower. These materials, such as paraffin wax and tar, are in a semi-solid state and never totally vaporize. That's a lot of diversity for something referred to as crude. It is a, a progression out of a barrel of crude oil, all the way from very simple molecules uh, that we would use in our, our gas grills for our barbecues to very heavy molecules that go into road tar. And gasoline is just a slice out of that carbon progression. But why do the six to 10 carbon chains in gasoline work better in internal combustion engines than some heavier or lighter petroleum product? Because gasoline gives you the best of both worlds. It can be stored as a liquid, which takes up less room than a gas. But it vaporizes more easily than any other liquid hydrocarbon. A step the engine's combustion chamber can't do without. The liquid gasoline will not combust. It has to be in a vapor state. If you don't get proper vaporization at the time of combustion, you generally have what's termed a misfire. And of course, that results in poor performance, poor fuel economy, high emissions. So when you put the pedal to the metal, gasoline is pumped from the tank to the engine. It mixes with air just before entering the combustion chamber, changing the liquid to a vapor. The vapor is squeezed as the cylinder comes up for more power and the spark plug ignites the mixture. The force of the explosion propels the piston down, turning the crankshaft, which is connected to the transmission, which uses gears to send the right amount of power to the wheels for smooth acceleration. But some gasolines provide better acceleration and overall performance than others, which is the reason for the range of prices of the pump. The biggest difference between the best grades of gasoline, usually called premium, ultimate, or supreme, and the middle and regular grades, is the octane rating. It measures the ability of the fuel to be compressed without spontaneously igniting before the piston is in position, and the spark plug fires. If you have octane that is too low in your gasoline, the gases are self-igniting before the piston can get to the top. And when this happens, this works against the power of your automobile, it decreases the power, plus it's very hard on the mechanical parts. Octane is the name of the eight carbon molecule that is part of gasoline. It can handle compression without igniting so well that they named the rating scale after it. At the other end is seven carbon heptane. Squeeze it just a little and it'll ignite. Scientists in the late 20s created an artificial scale, assigning heptane a zero and octane a rating of 100. This way, unknown fuels could be tested and compared to pure octane or pure heptane. So a gasoline with an 87 octane rating performs as if it contained 87% octane and 13% heptane, even though it actually contains molecules of many different lengths. The frustrating thing about octane is that low octane would please most engines most of the time. You only need that high octane a fraction of the time. During those extra bursts of power when accelerating. But long before anyone cared about octane or even gasoline for that matter, there was another product that dominated the early oil business. Next, drilling the first oil well and the birth of the refining industry. Considering the wide range of products, in addition to gasoline, that can be derived from crude oil, 
It's no wonder people make such a big deal about the price of a barrel of this smelly, gooey substance. And the whole fuss started in 1859, when a man named Edwin Drake drilled the first oil well. The well was drilled in 1859 to a total depth of 69 and a half feet. Within less than a year, over 1,500 wells had been drilled in and around Titusville, Pennsylvania, primarily because oil was close and shallow near the surface. Experiments at the time had shown that boiling small amounts of crude oil that had already bubbled to the surface allowed chemists to collect a new product known as kerosene, which could be used to light lamps. The drilling frenzy in Titusville began because Drake had proven there were vast amounts of oil farther underground. This great supply allowed kerosene to light lamps more cheaply than its blubbery competitor. Where whale blubber was becoming in short supply, the future of whale oil uh, seemed in question. And suddenly, magically, somebody comes up with this product that can be made from something coming out from the ground. Kerosene was separated from the rest of the crude oil materials in primitive refineries. They were appropriately called stills. The early refineries were basically just like a drum with a tube sticking out of it. It was very similar to um, what the moonshiners used to do. The process known as distillation boiled oil until it vaporized. Then the kerosene vapors were collected and condensed back to liquid form. In the 1800s, people couldn't have cared less about the gasoline which boiled and condensed just before the kerosene did. Before there was an obvious market for gasoline, it was seen as a nuisance. And after the refining process had produced the most kerosene that you could get out of it, uh, quite often the gasoline would be dumped into a nearby stream and float on away. Throughout the late 1800s, refining remained simple and was a cheap business to enter. Anyone could become a refiner. Then one refinery owner in Cleveland figured out how to outdo all of these small-time competitors. John D. Rockefeller said, if you can't beat them, then buy them. Instead of taking his profits early, he poured the money back into his company to buy refineries and the companies that transported oil and kerosene. The Rockefeller Trust, which was created uh, in the late 1800s, was put in place primarily to take advantage of the large number of in small independent producers. In other words, gathering these into a large entity. But because of the concentration of power, and the concentration of all the resources, it really became a monopoly. By 1880, Rockefeller's company controlled 90% of America's refining capacity. But just as kerosene had bumped whale oil off the market years earlier, very soon Thomas Edison's new invention would turn out the lights on the kerosene business. Fortunately for Rockefeller, the various people tinkering in their garages with the first automobiles found that gasoline worked best for internal combustion engines. Henry Ford came along uh, and started manufacturing cars with the combustion engine. That created a whole new market uh, for the oil industry to really focus itself on this new product, gasoline. It was just found market, unbelievable expansion, um, just beyond people's wildest dreams. Gasoline, the former hazardous nuisance, became the oil industry's savior. Between 1900 and 1910, the number of cars in America skyrocketed from about 10,000 to over half a million. And just about all of these cars needed gasoline. Refiners had to become more efficient to keep up with demand. Fractionating towers, which first appeared in 1908, improved distillation by allowing refiners to separate gasoline and other products from oil more quickly and accurately than earlier stills. This process turned about 15 to 20 percent of the oil into not so great gasoline, with octane ratings only in the 20s and 30s. But even with big oil discoveries in Texas in the early 1900s, those half a million cars on the road in 1910 were still stretching the limits of gasoline production. Refiners loved all of that business, 
but they had to come up with more gasoline. The answer came from this lab at Standard Oil of Indiana, one of the smaller companies created after Teddy Roosevelt broke up Rockefeller's Standard Oil monopoly. In 1911, scientist William Burton came up with a new process that finally cracked the case. He comes up with the idea for cracking to make more gasoline per barrel of oil as opposed to just separating out what they can. But it's a difficult process. Hydrocarbon molecules longer than gasoline, which had been collected in the fractionating tower, would be broken into pieces, creating more molecules in gasoline's range of six to 10 carbon chains. To break those longer chains, thermal cracking required temperatures of up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit and pressures many times that of normal atmosphere. And it scares the people running Standard Oil quite a bit. And they say, Mr. Burr, we're afraid you might blow the whole state of Indiana into Lake Michigan with this kind of pressure in a major refinery. Luckily for the people of Indiana, thermal cracking worked. The cracked shorter chains were sent back to a fractionating tower and collected. Suddenly, almost 50% of a barrel of oil could be turned into gasoline. And the octane was higher, too, with a rating of about 70. In order to avoid offering consumers two wildly different qualities of gasoline, the higher grade cracked gasoline was mixed with the inferior distilled gasoline to provide drivers with fuel in the 40 to 50 octane range. Thermal cracking spread throughout the industry, despite the expenses involved with such high heat and pressures. But refiners also wanted a way to boost the octane of the lower quality distilled gasoline. In 1922, chemist Thomas Midgley led the way. Refiners looked for some additive uh, that could kind of push the refining process and more quickly give us better gasoline. The research group that came up with the addition of tetraethyl lead in the 19-teens and early 20s was a heavyweight group. By 1925, the addition of lead helped boost consumer octane levels of gasoline about 10 to 15 points into the mid-50 range. The lead attached to gasoline molecules, making them more resistant to spontaneous combustion during compression. The quality kept getting better, but all that roaring around in the 1920s made quantity a problem once again. Competition was also racing ahead, with many more companies offering gasoline than today. Some were foreign-owned, such as Royal Dutch and the English companies Shell and British Petroleum. Many others were spin-offs created when Standard Oil was dissolved a decade earlier. And those smaller regional companies are the brands that we think of today when we drive down the highway. They are the Amoco and Exxon, Mobil. Those were all units of Standard Oil as controlled by the Rockefeller empire. Demand didn't increase as quickly during the Great Depression. At the same time, future supply didn't appear to be a problem when the first large oil reserves in the Middle East were discovered in 1938. But it would be several years before that oil would be available. And the beginning of World War II in 1939 led to a new critical need for gasoline and other oil products for military use. American refiners came through for the Allies by developing a new version of cracking that further increased gasoline yields from oil. Catalysts such as clays or precious metals were added to thermal cracking's extreme heat and pressure to crack the heavier hydrocarbons that wouldn't break before. Following another trip through a fractionating tower, gasoline yields from a barrel of oil went from about 45% to over 50%. The greatest advantage that the Allied forces had in World War II was an abundance of petroleum and petroleum products versus the Japanese and the Germans. Almost immediately after the beginning of hostilities, the industry was organized under the government to greatly expand the capacity a completely new refining process in 1940 also helped fuel the Allied advantage during World War II. Besides breaking up heavier hydrocarbons, catalysts were also used to perform some molecular molding. Catalytic reforming created chemical reactions, which reshaped low-octane molecules into more desirable high-octane configurations. 
Superior fuel and firepower led the Allies to victory. After the war, gasoline helped ignite a post-war consumer boom. And it was clear that Americans were going to need a lot of gasoline to fuel this lavish new lifestyle. Next, making sense of the maze of pipes, towers, and other units inside a modern refinery. From a distance, gasoline-producing refineries look pretty chaotic. Thick towers and thin towers placed at seemingly random intervals. Also dotting the landscape are squatty structures and storage tanks of various shapes and sizes. And all of this is connected by a spaghetti bowl of pipes heading off in all directions. But there is a method to the seeming madness. It really does follow a flow. You can follow the flow of crude oil coming in. It then goes to the certain processes depending on how it's separated. And the reason that there are so many pipes going around the refinery is that we have to keep all those products separate. After arriving by tanker ship at the dock from the large oil fields of the world in Alaska, Mexico, Venezuela, and the Middle East, crude oil heads to a good old-fashioned distillation unit. With a new twist, refiners use vacuum pressure, creating conditions below normal atmospheric pressure to lower the boiling point of the materials, which lowers their big heating bills. Instead of 700 degrees, Temperatures of 400 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit now do the trick. Like those of early refineries, the fractionating towers initially separate only about 20% of the oil into gasoline. The heavier products move to modern cat crackers, which now use fluid catalysts instead of solids to break things faster. And for the refiners, the quicker the cracking happens, the more gasoline they can squeeze out the other end in a single day. Another cracking process developed in the 1960s combines 1,000 degree heat, pressure up to 200 times atmosphere, and free-floating hydrogen atoms. Hydrocracking is a cracking process that's done in the presence of hydrogen. And so whereas other processes will uh, give you a variety of different kinds of molecules, Hydrocracking tends to give you just straight carbon chains that will be fully loaded up with the hydrogen. Straight carbon chains completely surrounded by hydrogen atoms are desirable because they are easy to reshape into high octane gasoline later on. The light gases which traveled out the top of the distillation tower head to an alkylation unit. This time, low temperatures just above freezing and low pressures, along with acid catalysts, are used to join molecules. The best thing about alkylation is the product that we get out of alkylation units is very high in octane. Reforming units, similar to those developed during World War II, still use catalysts and heat to reshape gasoline molecules into the most desirable shapes. For reasons that even a chemist is hard pressed to explain, Ring-shaped gasoline molecules are higher in octane and burn cleaner, something which became very important in the 1970s when refiners were ordered to get the lead out, which was still being added to gasoline to boost octane. When we discovered that lead was becoming deposited along roadways and uh, posed a hazard to children, um, there was an effort to remove lead from gasoline. So we had to find other ways to boost octane and provide that performance. But those processes increased the cost of producing gasoline. The bar for low pollution gasoline was raised even higher in 1990 when Congress passed the Clean Air Act. The most difficult thing we've asked refiners to do is since the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments uh, is to come up with cleaner burning gasolines targeted for specific regions. We have gasoline standards for cities like Los Angeles or Houston where the air pollution is a serious problem. They have different gasoline standards for Montana when pollution is not such a big issue. There are probably 55 different kinds of gasolines in the United States that are shipped around the country to different locations. The gasoline sold in Montana and other low pollution areas may produce more pollutants, but it's cheaper. 
This doesn't mean it's any lower quality. It's just not specially refined to burn cleaner than usual. Along with the varying standards, refiners also have to make summer and winter versions of all these different formulas. Since outside temperatures can affect how gasoline vaporizes and the amount of pollution released. All of these different versions combined with the huge cost of refining equipment and the pressure to keep gasoline prices low add up to very tight economies. You have so much money invested in the plants, such high-tech equipment, that you need to keep them running 24 hours a day to get your return. Running non-stop at large refineries used to require several thousand workers. But due to computerization, only about 600 people per shift are needed today. The sophisticated units that produce millions of gallons of gasoline every day can be monitored from one or two control rooms. Other workers use bicycles, golf carts, and trucks to move around and perform all of the tough work. Out here, safety is the number one priority. You were growing up in the refining country. It was not uncommon to have classmates whose dad had been killed in refinery explosions. It was just a fact of life. Things have really changed dramatically since then. But despite all of the costs and complexities of making gasoline, the job is only half done. Next, the amazing infrastructure, 100 years in the building, that moves gasoline to the marketplace. Long before high-tech tanker trucks did the job, at the dawn of the 20th century, horse-drawn wagons with wooden containers transported gasoline from refineries. They delivered fuel to general stores, where it was sold by the bucket. You brought it back to your house and filled up your car. They tried a delivery system where they had wagons deliver the gasoline to your house, but they found they blew up too often, and it was too dangerous a way to distribute gasoline. To reduce gasoline's exposure to sparks and flames out in the open, especially near people's homes, Sylvanus Bowser of Fort Wayne, Indiana, adapted his oil pump for gasoline use in 1905. Soon after that, primitive filling stations hooked up curbside pumps where people could fuel their cars in the street. But as the number of cars grew, congestion became a problem. So in 1913, the first real drive-in service station known by the Gulf Corporation opened for business in Pittsburgh. By 1920, non-flammable metal tanks on trucks and special railroad tanker cars provided more protection during delivery, although fires from leaks were still fairly common. Oil manufacturers have been using a safer transportation method for decades, moving product in pipelines. By the 1930s, refiners were transporting gasoline the same way. A 20-inch pipeline carries about 150,000 barrels a day. That equates to about 750 trucks that would be on the road. And when you think in terms of that many trucks on the road, there are issues with regard to safety, there are issues with regard to cost. The, the price of gasoline would be almost doubled, if not more. Pipeline is the most safe and efficient way of transporting barrels throughout the United States. By 1956, there were over 36,000 miles of pipelines for gasoline in America. Today, there are more than 150,000 miles of these pipelines beneath our feet. Pump stations located every 50 miles or so keep the fuel moving. Before computers, workers separated different products inside pipelines using small plungers, known as pigs. Their name came from the fact that they would make a squealing sound as they moved through the pipes. And they're still used today for cleaning. This is a pipeline pig. This is a, a cleaning pig. This is uh, four inch in diameter, and these things come in various different sizes, uh, as big as 60 inches in diameter. This actually travels along in the flow of the product. These cups are drive cups, so the, the fluid actually pushes the pig along the pipeline. Pipeline engineers have also developed smart pigs by attaching sophisticated electronic sensors to extra long units. They don't squeal but they do talk back to the controllers, telling them exactly where cracks may be developing, so repairs can be made before a problem occurs. Gasoline and other products can now run continuously instead of shutting down to insert product-separating pigs. Thanks to the computerized flow controls, 
at a handful of traffic control centers. Here, they keep the amount of mixing between products to a minimum. We have what's called a batching system. We'll batch gasoline, we'll batch uh, premium and regular, diesel fuel, jet fuel, etc. We don't put anything in between those. There is some commingling of the product, and that's put into what's called a transmix tank, and then that's sold to a different market. Some of that mixture is sent back to refineries to be separated once again. The rest is sold to industries that can use any type of fuel to power their equipment. Pipelines are operated in one of two ways. 95% work as common carriers, and 5% are known as dedicated. For instance, a pipeline running from a Chevron refinery to a Chevron terminal where Chevron trucks deliver gasoline to Chevron stations is a dedicated system. But the other 95% of pipelines, especially long ones running all the way from Houston to the upper Midwest or East Coast, are common carrier pipelines. Several companies buy time from the pipeline operator. This system leads to a very interesting fact that gasoline companies don't exactly volunteer to consumers. All gasoline is basically the same. Or as the industry says, fungible. A fancy word for generic. When Shell puts in a barrel of gasoline in Houston, Texas, that barrel that Shell put in is not necessarily the same wet barrel that they'll get out in Chicago or, or some other location. But it is of the same specification required by all shippers. A shipper can put a barrel into uh, our system at Baytown, Texas from a refinery today and take a barrel out of the system in the Midwest or Northeast on the same day. So they don't have to wait the 13-day transit time on our system. In the shared pipeline system, one company's regular unleaded or super unleaded is the same as another's. The last chance companies have to put their personal stamp on gasoline is at the terminal by mixing in chemical additives. There are the qualities that you want to make your particular product stand out. That's done by additives. And so there's enormous amount of research going into additives that will clean the engine, that will stop corrosion, that will reduce the amount of wear. The only problem is that all of the chemical additives do basically those same few things, as well as boosting octane and lowering emissions. That means it's up to the marketing department to convince consumers that you can put a tiger in your tank or drive your engine clean if you use the right brand. For a time, historically, there were dramatic differences produced by different refining processes. But as time passes by the 60s, 70s, and on into the present, those differences uh, get a lot less. So that uh, most companies, while they would like to advertise how much better their gasoline is than their competitors, are selling essentially the same product. The additives are stored separately at terminals. Pipelines from refineries feed directly into temporary gasoline tanks capable of holding 50,000 gallons each. When a truck pulls up to what is known as the rack to be filled, pumps move the proper grade of gasoline out of the right storage tank and into the truck. The chemical additives kept in smaller tanks are put in at the last second, so mixtures can be precisely controlled. Our trucks uh, have a capacity of about 9,000 gallons. Uh, with the system that we have here with the pumps, uh, in our loading rack layout, we can load a truck in approximately 10 to 15 minutes. And that's from the time our driver pulls onto the rack and pulls off of the rack. From there, the drivers are off to the service station. Each truck is separated into three or four compartments. So different grades of gasoline can be delivered to underground storage tanks. This incredibly efficient delivery system helps keep gasoline prices low. But if gasoline is to remain the fuel of choice, it's going to have to compete with emerging lower emission alternatives. Next, the future, gasoline versus the alternatives. Today, gasoline is designed to produce less pollution than ever before. Special formulas of gasoline with reshaped molecules and catalytic converters on automobile exhaust systems both help cars run cleaner. 
but each gallon of gas still releases about five pounds of carbon and other pollutants into the atmosphere, mostly as invisible carbon dioxide gas. There's no question that um, lower emissions is the focus of uh, fuel development today. We've made great strides over the past 30 or 40 years, but the greatest challenge for gasoline in the future is to maintain its focus on reduced emissions. Researchers are constantly testing different formulas of gasoline in engines under a variety of conditions to find the best combination of performance, reliability, and low emissions. At the conclusion of a test, we will tear the engines down, take a look inside, weigh specific parts, for example, to measure different performance features, and then evaluate our product and how to make improvements on that product. Besides being made cleaner, gasoline can also be mixed with other materials to reduce pollution. Combining gasoline with ethanol, an alcohol made from corn or other crops, is one way of slightly lowering emissions while also decreasing the overall consumption of gasoline. Cars in the Midwest already run on mixtures containing about 10 to 15 percent ethanol. But gasoline isn't the only current vehicle fuel that can be mixed with other products to lower emissions and reduce oil use. Diesel fuel can be combined with something known as biodiesel to achieve similar results. Biodiesel is produced from uh, living plants uh, such as soy, bean oil, and also can be produced from animal fat. Think of the grocery store, a bottle of general purpose vegetable oil. It isn't the raw oil from crushing the seeds. The material uh, has been processed and refined to make it into a product that we would use for cooking. And the same type of improvement of the oil through refining makes it into a material that's suitable as a diesel fuel. Since gasoline and diesel can both be mixed with lower emission materials made from renewable sources, it's hard to determine which combination makes more sense. The basic design of a diesel engine may eventually give that fuel the edge. The biggest difference is that diesel doesn't require a spark plug. You squeeze the diesel fuel down to a smaller volume that generates more heat, and that heat is then able to ignite the diesel without a spark. Because of the higher compression ratio, the diesel engine will be, on average, about 30% more efficient. Biodiesel and ethanol can also power the respective engines entirely on their own, with only minor modifications. This would lower emissions even further and drastically reduce oil dependency. But these biofuels may be hard-pressed to meet the demand for a huge number of cars. In most studies that I have seen, suggests that the, the amount of cropland they require just exceeds the available cropland we have, even in a land-abundant country such as the United States. Since alternative gasoline and diesel mixtures still release pollution, the search continues for a true zero-emission answer. Electric cars don't pollute, but drivers can usually only drive about 100 miles before they have to stop to recharge. So gasoline still helps out, in the form of hybrid vehicles. These cars have two engines, internal combustion and electric. Hybrids are gaining wider acceptance as costs from a two-engine system begin to come down. Since less power is needed from the internal combustion engine, smaller, less wasteful models can be used. The electric motor does a lot of the work and in most systems is recharged during normal driving by the power generated when the car brakes or by the internal combustion engine if needed. Therefore, less gasoline is used. This means less pollutants are released into the atmosphere compared to cars powered solely by gasoline. Besides electric motors, fuel cells are another possible zero emissions alternative to gasoline powered engines. In order to eliminate any pollution, pure hydrogen must be fed into the fuel cell. A special membrane separates hydrogen electrons and protons. The electrons are forced to travel around the membrane. This movement creates electricity. Then they rejoin with the protons, and the hydrogen combines with available oxygen. In this case, the only exhaust is water. 
truly zero emissions. The problem is that pure hydrogen isn't so easy to come by. Hydrogen is cited by many scientists as our most abundant element on Earth, which it is. But the hydrogen that exists on Earth is combined with other elements, primarily as a hydrocarbon or as water. Pure hydrogen can be separated from other materials at special plants and is already being shipped to a small number of experimental hydrogen refilling stations. But it will take some time before pure hydrogen is available everywhere that gasoline is now. When we drive around, we don't think about the network that moves gasoline uh, to our cities. When people talk about moving to the hydrogen economy, for example, that would require us to start all over again from scratch. So just as in hybrid electric cars, gasoline is sneaking into the fuel cell scenario, since it contains a lot of hydrogen. Powering fuel cells with the hydrogen found in gasoline would still produce some emissions. But since fuel cells are much more efficient than internal combustion engines, you'll be able to go a lot farther on that gallon of gas. An alternative that wouldn't require any infrastructure is solar power. It can already propel light research vehicles and may be used in the near future to provide part of a car's power. But it will be some time before researchers can squeeze enough horsepower from solar cells to fuel a heavy consumer car. Since the more immediately viable electric and fuel cell options still involve the use of gasoline, it seems this familiar fuel will be with us for some time. Gasoline has come a long way in a hundred years, and apparently still has a long way to go. We've thoroughly adopted gasoline as a fundamental part of our economy, the fundamental driving force in our transportation system. What happens in the future will depend greatly on the continuous technological advances and competing processes. The fuel race is on. Gasoline will keep getting cleaner. However, it seems likely that other fuels will eventually overcome their technical limitations or supply problems to surpass it. But in today's world, gasoline still reigns supreme.